career in, in, uh, in the world of academics. He's a retired professor of history from the University of Minnesota Duluth, among other things. Uh, his real interest uh, and areas of expertise, and we have been the benefactors of that in our Southeast uh, Ollie uh, chapter here in, in Tucson, uh, World War II and World War I. And he's written a couple of books. Uh, I think the latest was on landing craft or uh, used during World War, a specific landing craft uh, in World War II. But he got, uh, he got interested in the Civil War and uh, uh, fortunately, and today we're going to uh, hear about a uh, brilliant engineer by the name of John Erickson. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend, Jerry Sandvik. Okay, well, thank you, Gene. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I, uh, I want to, I suppose I should subtitle of this talk, uh, everything about John Erickson except for the USS Monitor. That of course is his main claim to fame and what we remember, remember him about. Uh, as Gene said, my uh, real uh, academic expertise such as I possess it is really 20th century and World War I and II, but I have gotten more interested in the Civil War really thanks to Gene getting me involved with the Civil War Roundtable and uh, talking Civil War history with some of you folks. Uh, and my focus really has been more on the naval aspect of the war because it coincides with some other uh, interests that I have. Title of the talk was The Engineering Genius of John Erickson. And I suppose if we take genius as being defined as uh, somebody that's particularly adept or talented in a, in a given field, uh, he certainly was a, uh, a genius of, of mechanical engineering. But I think another, uh, perhaps even a better subtitle would be what I have on the screen here, that he was both the premier uh, engineer of the 19th century or in many ways, the forgotten uh, engineer of the 19th century. I'm embarrassed to say that my first academic uh, piece of footnote literature here is an 1887 cigarette card. Uh, not exactly heavy duty uh, academic stuff, but I couldn't resist this because look at the list of great Americans. Uh, and I, of course, underline John uh, Erickson here, but I won't obviously read all through them, but you'll notice uh, Thomas Jefferson, Andy Jackson, uh, <clears throat> Francis Scott Key, a great many. So just a couple of years before his death uh, on one of these sort of throwaway popular uh, sort of handouts, uh, there, is, uh, there is Erickson listed. Erickson was an interesting man in many ways. Like many talented engineers, he did not suffer fools gladly. Uh, he could be extremely cantankerous. Some of you know he could carry a, a, a grudge greatly, and he especially carried grudges toward the U.S. Navy, with which he was intimately uh, connected, of course. Uh, he could frequently be angry. Uh, he was very touchy, could be secretive, and yet in many ways he was a brilliant man. He is sometimes a forgotten engineer, but when I began to research some of his life, I found a number of ways that he was recognized, one through some stamps. Uh, clearly he's commemorated uh, in 1926, and then again later in the 90s by US stamps, and there's a 1976 uh, stamp from his native Sweden. And you'll notice uh, the Swedish stamp particularly uh, has uh, the imprint uh, of the, the image of one of his principal inventions, the screw propeller. There are a number of Ericsson memorials, so I think he is hardly a forgotten engineer, certainly not uh, as well known to the public as, as a Thomas Edison or, uh, or uh, perhaps a Charles Goodyear. And I think part of the reason for that is you see, unlike Goodyear, Edison, 
uh, Eastman, uh, Charles West, Westinghouse, uh, Erickson did not establish uh, a, an ongoing industry that, that bears his name like others I've just mentioned, but there's a major monument to him in Washington, D.C. There's one in New York City where he lived all of his American life, at least. And there are uh, memorials in his native Sweden, most noticeably the one I show you the picture uh, of here in Stockholm. There are a number of biographies of Ericsson, um, primarily the one on the, the right that you see, uh, William Kona Church. Uh, there are some others, the man who made the monitor that's gotten some kind of mixed reviews. Uh, but of course, there are nowhere near uh, the kind of historical uh, literature about Erickson that you find of uh, a Thomas Edison or uh, uh, others. I think the premier biography and the one I used uh, extensively in, in researching a bit of his life was published in 1891 uh, by uh, William Cone at Church. This is the uh, 1911 version that I was able to get a hold of to use. Uh, but this was the first and uh, remains the most comprehensive uh, biography of John Erickson's life, and it is uh, a very positive, uh, a, a laudatory, somewhat laudatory uh, biography, I would have to say. Erickson was born in Sweden, 1803. His birthplace is a little town called Langeban, and uh, near his birthplace there is this mo monument uh, erected here, you see on the lower left. There is also in the nearby town of Philipstad a uh, memorial to John and Nils. Nils Erickson was his older brother, one year older, and also uh, himself a premier uh, mechanical engineer. I show you this little map just to give you an indication. Uh, in American terms, Langeban would just be a small town, and Philipstad would be the nearby, we would call it a county seat in this country. And on my lower map of Sweden, I just put a little red dot there to indicate about where it was kind of in the south, I guess you'd say south central uh, part of Sweden. Ericsson, as I say, born in 1803. His father, Olaf Ericsson, was uh, not a degreed man, a formal engineer, but uh, he was a mine supervisor, a practical engineer. And he was known as an explosives expert. His two sons, uh, Nils and uh, John, uh, both grew up to be mechanical engineers. And we know from his biographies that Erickson was, uh, just showed a talent and a fascination with machinery at a very, very young age. But in all the biographical material, it indicates that his first major foray, if you will, into engineering, came, believe it or not, when he was uh, at the age of 12, a major Swedish project called the Gota Canal, which you see here uh, on the upper uh, right, they were building this canal to cross Sweden to avoid, uh, and if you can see my cursor here, going around the more somewhat treacherous route around southern Sweden through the uh, waterways known as the Skagerrak and the Kattegat. Uh, this allowed uh, commerce to go across Sweden th connected through some inland waterways. But there was a great deal of filling, cutting, and canal digging here. And uh, believe it or not, at the age of 12, Ericsson was employed as a, a draftsman. He showed real talent at, at making engineering drawings. And within a couple of years, at the age of 14, he was out in the field working as a surveyor. His father uh, was a major uh, uh, supervisor in this canal construction, hence, uh, hence the connection. But that is how he really first comes on the stage, John does at age 12 and 14, as a worker surveyor on this canal, uh, go to canal construction. His older brother, Nils, by the way, that you see down here, uh, was one of the prime movers in, in design construction of the canal and later uh, in his life, uh, a major railroad engineer and builder in Sweden. And uh, there is, of course, a statue of Nils Ericsson uh, in, in Stockholm. So he comes by it honestly uh, in, in a 
in a real sense. Uh, at the age of 17, he joins the army. I was never able to find a picture of him, but these are the type of, of uh, uniforms that the post-Napoleonic uh, Swedish army would have worn. And we know that at the age of 17, he joined um, the Swedish army, became, uh, went through some training, became uh, an engineering officer, surveying officer uh, with the rank of lieutenant. And this was a turning point in his life in his late teens. He was given various um, assignments around, uh, around Sweden. And at one point, uh, this would be uh, approximately 18, uh, around 1820, 23 in there, we can't date it exactly. He was assigned to do some serious map making in Northern Sweden. And in doing so, he was uh, living with a boarding at the house of a retired Swedish army captain uh, whose name was uh, Jakob Lilliskold. Turned out that Captain Lilliskold had a, a rather attractive daughter, Carolina. Uh, I probably need not go too deep in deep detail in great detail where this is going to lead, but Carolina Lilliskold and Mr. Uh, Erickson formed a, a bond with one another. Uh, Carolina became pregnant. John Erickson said that he would like to marry her. They were apparently quite in love, but Jakob, Captain uh, Jakob, decided that, quote, according to the church biography, quote, Erickson was a common young man with no prospects whatever for the future. And he was not about to have his daughter marry such a person. And so two things happened. Carolina was sent off to Stock Stockholm, where she bore a son. And the biographers indicate that uh, Erickson never, uh, was never a part of, of that son's life. He, he apparently met him once later in life, uh, provided some financial support, but it was just a, a non-relationship uh, from the get-go. The other part of it was that because of this, uh, shall we say, uh, failed romance, it drove him out of Sweden, never to return. And in 1826, he left Sweden and went to London. London at this time was a hotbed of the Industrial Revolution. I just show you a couple random pictures here. Uh, the Thames River was being bridged in London. It's also at this time that the first tunnel was being dug under the Thames. It was simply a, a hotbed, as I say, of the early Industrial Revolution. And the group of men who were mechanical engineers uh, formed really a, a very small fraternity. And once he arrived in London, Erickson very quickly uh, began uh, to become acquainted with other uh, uh, men in his field, most notably a man named John Brathwaite. Brathwaite was half a dozen years older than Erickson, was impressed with Erickson as a young engineer, Brathwaite being a responsible uh, engineer himself. He and Erickson formed a, a partnership. Uh, Brathwaite had the money to uh, support such a partnership. And they began to build, as far as I can tell, some of the very first steam engine powered uh, firefighting, uh, pumping uh, engines for, for firefighting that were ever done. This one uh, was uh, patented in, in uh, the very late 20s. It was billed as being able to pump 180 gallons of water a minute, which was a substantial improvement uh, over the, the hand pumpers at the time. I looked it up, modern pumpers can do at least 500 to 1,000 or more gallons a minute, depending, but this one did 180 and it was very good. They did, it was not a commercial success. They sold a couple to some German firms as uh, I found. Uh, but they offered it to the London Fire Department, who wanted nothing to do with it. It was uh, simply too radical of an invention. And the, uh, the London Fire Laddies, as they were called, uh, simply wanted nothing to do with it. Erickson's real, I think, uh, entry onto the world stage 
comes with something called the Rainhill Locomotive Trials. And we know Erickson, of course, because of his um, design of the monitor later and other, air, of, uh, other nautical uh, matters. But it's not often known that he came very, very close, not quite, but very close to being one of the premier railroad uh, engineers. And here's briefly the story of what happened. As I said, London was, England was the hotbed of, of the early industrial revolution. And it was around the 1820s and 30s that the steam railroad was in its infancy. And the story here is that there is a place in central London, England, the rain, uh, called Rainhill. And the plan was that a, a firm was going to build uh, a railroad between Liverpool and Manchester. And I show you this map here, you can see Liverpool and Manchester are in the industrial Midlands. And so uh, this was about a 30 mile rail line. It was the first steam railroad line ever anywhere. And so they were going to build it and it was a tremendous engineering feat. It demanded a lot of cut, a lot of fills some tunnels, bridges and so on, which is of course beyond the scope of this talk. But a competition was ordered for the locomotive. Now I won't go into all the details, but the locomotive uh, had to be steam powered, didn't have to be steam powered, but that was the assumption. It was going to uh, draw a certain number of cars. There were certain specifications, but basically a prize of about $2,500, 500 pounds, $2,500 roughly was being offered. And there was simply a comp uh, competition among engineers to do this. At that time, locomotives were so new and unique that they gave them names. And there were four locomotives. Actually, there were five uh, competitors, which I'll get to in a moment. I think you might get a kick out of one of them. But the four steamers were the Perseverance, the Rocket, the Novelty, and the Sans Parallel. This was the other one. It was called the Cycloped. And a man, uh, and, and the gentleman that, that entered it, uh, you can see on the lower right there, it was, it was a cart that had a treadmill and there were two horses that walked this treadmill. Uh, the only reason it was accepted at all is that the man who thought he, the man who designed it and thought it was a good idea was a member of the, the, the committee uh, that determined the prizes. And so they couldn't really, you know, kick him out. Um, it was sort of a goofy invention. Uh, one of the horses in, in a trial fell through the floorboards in the London newspaper reported that thankfully the poor horse was rescued without damage. One of the other locomotives um, was withdrawn uh, from the competition. And so basically what it was is there were three of these locomotives, the Rocket, the Novelty, and the Sans Perel. Whoops, what happened here? Just press your back button, Jerry. All of a sudden, we got a Japanese battleship. Uh, I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. There we are. Did everybody see that? Yes, you're good. Yes. Okay. Um, at any rate, what happened was that the the novelty you can see here i hope on my screen the novelty was designed by brathwaite uh, and erickson and the short version of this very simply is that um one of the steamers had an accident and was withdrawn uh, but essentially a competition was held uh, and uh the Sans Perel really dropped out and the competition was between the novelty of Ericsson and Brathwaite and this one called the Rocket. Well, what happened is uh, leaving out a lot of details in terms of speed and lightness and size and so on, Ericsson and Brathwaite's novelty uh, was really the very best. It had a smaller boiler, it was more fuel efficient, but what they had done, uh, you see the three here and this is Ericsson's back here, what they had done to make a smaller and lighter weight locomotive is uh, develop a forced draft uh, boiler. So 
uh, the fire in the boiler uh, basically had a, a, a metal bellows feeding it air um, to run a hotter temperature. And it gave their, uh, their engine the novelty more speed at a, at a lighter distance, but basically, or at a lighter uh, weight. But essentially what happened was that during the trial, this iron bellows failed. They came very close, as we might say, close but no cigar. And the result of it was that George Stephenson, the pie was and is recognized as the, the great pioneer of, of railroads in general, British Railroad in particular. Uh, his engine, the rocket, was on display at the Science Museum in, in London for many years. Now it's at the uh, Railroad Museum in York, where I've seen it. Uh, these are some contemporary sketches. And any book on railroad history will tell you that George Stephenson or Stevenson is the great pioneer. Erickson came ever so close, but not quite. This is a, a good drawing of uh, his locomotive uh, from the church biography. And I like the, uh, the, the last statement that I've underlined here where Erickson said uh, that the locomotive is not a product of any single man, but of a nation of engineers. And I think that captures some of his philosophy very well, that uh, he always believed that engineering was an improvement on a great many other things. I couldn't resist showing you this because here's a replica of the novelty uh, that still runs in show. They still run it in, in various railroad exercises, shows in England. Uh, and you notice a Mr. and Mrs. Brathwaite dressed in co uh, period costumes. And apparently this uh, Mr. Brathwaite here is a direct descendant of the descendant of the John Brathwaite that worked with Erickson. But this gives you a good idea, even though it's obviously a modern replica. Um, it's very exact replica of the size and, and what this uh, steam engine uh, looked like. Well, the steam engine novelty came up just short. In the 1830s, uh, this was in 1829, and the 1830s were not a good time in uh, Erickson's life. Uh, he was in prison on a couple of, uh, on two occasions. When I say prison, I mean it was a debtor's prison. He was guilty of no such thing as felonies or anything like that. But at this time in England, if you fell behind in debt, and he was deeply in debt because of uh, engineering uh, expense that had gone into the novelty and so on. Uh, he was put in the King's Bench prison, which was a debtor's uh, prison, um, something well in the past, uh, but he served a couple of times in, in debtor's prison until he was able to work himself out of uh, that debt. At about, at, at about that same time in 1836, uh, he married uh, an English woman named Amelia Byam and it turned out to be an absolute disastrous marriage. Uh, John was 33 at the time. She was, I think, 18 or 19. Came from a fairly wealthy family. Uh, why they got married, I really don't know. It seems like they didn't get along from day one. Um, the marriage was, was uh, a failure right from the start. Um, after he moved to New York, she came to New York with him decided she hated America, hated New York, and didn't particularly like Erickson, apparently, and went back to England. She came back to New York in the early 1830s for a brief time, went back to England, he never saw her again. Um, they never divorced, but they simply never lived together. Uh, it was, uh, I suppose you simply say, perhaps simply a non-marriage. It's during this time too, in the 1830s and 40s, that Erickson worked on something that was a lifelong uh, obsession of his, a caloric engine. And I mention this only because, uh, not to go into any details, because I don't uh, understand the thermodynamic details of it myself, but it was basically Erickson's idea that a steam engine in design could be made much more efficient without using steam, but simply using hot air. There are a number of physical thermodynamic reasons for this, he designed several of these heat, or he called them caloric engines. Uh, they never really were a success for anything very large. In 1852, he was able to get financial backing of almost 
actually half a million dollars, to build a ship powered by one of these caloric engines. And you can see uh, he named it the Ericsson 1852. And you can see it was a paddle wheeler, if you can see the lower picture here. Uh, and it was powered by one of these caloric engines. The problem if, with it was, was the engine itself was just enormous in terms of physical size. And it only put out enough power to drive the ship at about eight knots. Now that was half the speed of other steamers uh, that were coming uh, into service at the time. Uh, so it, it was very fuel efficient, but it was also not a very practical matter because given the size of the engine, there was very little room for cargo. Uh, it was a lifelong obsession of his to develop this caloric engine, which he believed would be more efficient, safer um, than uh, the steam boilers and, and uh, producing steam. And he was right in that sense. But as it turned out, uh, these heat engines were really much more adaptable to small uh, uses. And there was pretty much a dead end when it came to uh, uh, in ships. The Rainhill trials and his involvement in, uh, his involvement in uh, railroad work led him to become acquainted with two men who were very uh, influential as his life went on, Francis B. Ogden and uh, an officer, naval officer Stockton. It was at this time that, Ogd that um, Erickson was very interested in developing a method that, of driving a ship transferring power from a steam engine to drive a ship that would be much more efficient than the paddle wheels. The paddle wheels were not an efficient uh, uh, transfer of energy. And what's more, if you think about it, paddle wheels were wholly unsuited for a combat vessel. They're big, they're right amidships. They're, they're, they're just hopeless for a combat vessel. Ericsson and others had at about the same time the idea of developing a screw type propeller now, Ericsson and a British uh, inventor named Francis Pettit Smith are contemporaries on this. And I show you these pictures uh, just to indicate that we've got to be very careful when we talk about, talk about firsts and so on. You notice here, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica has it that Ericsson developed the screw propeller. Here, where he is inter, uh, he's, um, inducted into the National uh, Inventors Hall of Fame. I don't know if you could read this, but John Erickson invented the screw propeller. Over here, Sir Francis Pettit Smith, inventor of the screw propeller. Marker on the house where he lived in Great Britain, pioneer of the screw propeller. I think as a historian, we sometimes get way too hung up on firsts in any case, but basically what it is here is that Ericsson and the British Francis Pettit Smith uh, developed the screw propeller at about the same time, but the real inventor, of course, goes back several hundred years, and that's our friend Archimedes. Probably in school, you learned the old story about Archimedes sitting in a bathtub screaming Eureka and running down the street saying he had discovered the laws of buoyancy. Makes a good story, how true, we don't know. But ever since the ancient world, the Archimedes screw that you see here had been used to move water. And many other inventors have, had tried to adapt this Archimedes screw to driving a ship. Francis Pettit Smith was the first that did it. And here uh, is an 1836 drawing of uh, Pettit Smith's uh, screw propeller. Now, I mentioned Ogden and Stockton. Ogden was, I show you this president, uh, president of the United States, only because to show you the official documentation, Ogden was the uh, US consul to Great Britain at the time. And he very much believed in Ericsson. Ogden was something of an inventor himself, as well as a government official. And so he, he financed a small boat and it was called the Francis B. Ogden. Uh, Erickson designed the boat and he came up with a double screw propeller like this. 
the two disks, the two helixes turned counter, uh, counter rotated. It was a small boat and for the life of me, I have not been able to find a sketch or anything of this, uh, this boat, but it served as a little tugboat. And it's a rather unfortunate story because what happened was that he actually gave Ericsson uh, gave a demonstration of this screw developed, screw driven, uh, screw propeller driven tugboat, and actually took some members of the British Navy, some of the admirals, leading admirals, out on a cruise on this little boat. Tried to interest them, uh, and they seemed interested, but uh, dashed his hopes when they said, no, the Royal Navy was not interested in this, because they said, A, the screw propeller was not suited for. Uh, open uh, work on the open seas, maybe on a river with a tugboat, okay, but not for a, a major ship on the high seas. And secondly, they firmly believed that if the screw propeller was at the stern of the ship, you could not steer the ship. All I can say to that is uh, Erickson's biographer says, said he wondered where this nautical philosopher got that idea. Erickson went on to build another ship, and I mentioned he had a relationship with Robert Stockton. Stockton was a naval officer as well as a, um, a very wealthy man from New Jersey, and he decided to fund uh, an ocean-going ship, logically named the Robert F. Stockton, and here's the propeller that was used. Another diagram here. And here's the Robert Stockton. Now this gets into a whole interesting story, but here's the Stockton under sail. The ship was built in Great Britain. It was a steamer powered by Ericsson's screw propeller, but it crossed the Atlantic under sail. It's the first ship, steam screw ship uh, to cross the Atlantic, but it did so under sail for the very simple reason that uh, these early steamers could not carry sufficient supply of coal uh, to get them across the Atlantic, but he did. And once he got to the United States under the guidance, if you will, and, and funding and influence of Robert Stockton, the US Navy's first screw propelled steamer was built and it was the USS Princeton named after Stockton's uh, hometown. Stockton was quite a character. And I want to read you just a brief uh, excerpt, something about Stockton's character, because it uh, reflects on him. Um, he was the military governor of a certain area in California for a time, and this is from a letter Stockton wrote. He said, my word is at present the law of the land here. My person is more regal than any other kings, and haughty and high-level men wish to shake hands with me, and beautiful women look on me always with joy and gladness. Obviously not a man with a small opinion of himself. Here's what one of Stockton's officers wrote. Commander Stockton at times is at very best a crazy man. He is pompous, he is inflated, he is phlegmatic, he is morose, he is frequently coarse and vulgar in his conversation and his manners. He is wrapped up in his own importance. He is totally regardless of the feelings of others. He is vain beyond belief. He is unable to utter a single sentence without involving the words, I, Robert Stockton. I mention his character because of something that's coming up. Erickson designed the USS Princeton. Uh, this is what the propeller looked like. This is a modern photograph, but as best I can tell, this is what the propeller looked like. The Princeton uh, was very much a success. It was the first, uh, let me go back. It was the first um, steam uh, screw propeller steamer that the US Navy had. It was a success until February of 44. What happened was that in February 44, the Princeton was being demonstrated on the Potomac River. A group of high level uh, government officials were aboard. And without too much detail, the, the Princeton carried two large guns. One was designed by Erickson and Stockton had taken it on himself to design the other gun when he was no engineer or gun designer. <laughs> 
He was warned that this gun was not safe. Stockton could do no wrong in his, in his opinion. And so leaving out the details, what he did is he charged the gun and fired it one more time than he should have. The gun exploded. Six people were killed, including the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Navy. It was a catastrophe. President Tyler, whose picture I show you here, was aboard the ship but was uh, below decks at the time and was not hurt. This is the type of gun that it was. It was cast iron and the, the, uh, the breech area here uh, exploded and the shrapnel killed people. The reason I mention this story is that immediately after it happened, Stockton tried to shift the blame to Erickson. Now Erickson had designed the ship. He had nothing whatsoever to do with this gun that exploded. In fact, he had asked uh, or had warned uh, Stockton that it was unsafe. Stockton tried to tar Erickson uh, with this catastrophe. He sort of succeeded. A Naval Board of Inquiry was held. Uh, Stockton was not held responsible at all, largely because of his political and financial influence, I think. Erickson was not charged either, but the government also refused to pay Erickson for his design work for the Princeton. It left a real legacy of bitterness during this hearing. Erickson was asked to come and testify in Stockton's behalf. He refused. Stockton hated him for the rest of his life. Uh, it was a tragic episode. But essentially what happened is that Erickson was, was, was tarred uh, with responsibility uh, that he should not have been. Uh, and he resented it bitterly. Uh, for the U.S. Navy uh, for a long time. Along with the screw propeller, one of Erickson's other designs was the gun turret. You see an early sketch of his here. Just like the screw propeller, there is a co-designer or a com competitive designer, if you will. Uh, this was William Cowper Coles. Uh, Cowper Coles was a British uh, engineer and designed a turret uh, very, very similar uh, to that of Ericsson. Again, it's an example of, of um, serendipity, I suppose, of twin uh, engineers and, or two engineers designing uh, twin technology at approximately the same time. Um, the Ericsson uh, turret was used, of course, on the monitor. Let's us do the monitor. No. I'm not going to say much about the monitor for the simple reason that I think for folks that know Civil War, if you know anything about Ericsson, you do know the monitor. But what I would say about the monitor really uh, is that uh, I think the, in engineering terms, the history of technology terms, the interesting thing about it is that as Ericsson himself admitted, there was not really one new thing. Ironclads had been built before, Le Gois in France, the warrior in Great Britain, and ironclad was not new. The turret has been used before, the screw propeller. It was a weapon system, we'd say today. It was the way that Ericsson took this technology and put it all together. Many of you know he had very little time to, to design and shepherd the building of the monitor. He didn't use any experimental technology. It was a weapon system that in his brilliance, he really put together. And of course, the story of the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the fight between the Monitor uh, and the, uh, the Virginia Merrimack is a well-known Hampton Roads battle, March of 62. Uh, and purpose of my talk as I get to conclusion here is not to go into that. But just to indicate that the monitor uh, was the first of, of this type of ship built by the US, for the US Navy. He followed it up with some other classes. Uh, they look very, very similar. But basically, in my picture on the upper left here, uh, the two follow on classes were the Passaic class and the Canonicus class. And they were basically, you would call them improved monitors. They were larger, they had a different hull design, they were more seaworthy. Uh, one of the big faults of the monitor was that the pilot house was down here, just raised above the deck and very, very difficult to use. And here is a picture of one of the Passaic, the 
with the follow-on classes, this is actually the USS Lehigh, but it's a Passaic class. And you notice the pilot house has been moved to the top of the turret where it is not on the monitor down here. You can see it a little better on the deck. Uh, but these are essentially improved monitors and uh, they were uh, uh, used uh, quite, quite a little in the Civil War, about 10 of the Passaics and another nine or 10, nine it was, the uh, Canonicalist class were built. They were essentially improved monitors, uh, imp improved uh, airflow into the boilers and technical things like that. It was also the Casco class, and these were shallow draft monitors. And here's another sad story, uh, or perhaps it's one all too familiar of government waste, I suppose. The idea was a monitor type ship that uh, had a shallow draft that could be used in, in river warfare, particularly in the Mississippi. The problem was that the Erickson designed this shallow draft monitor. Then it was turned over to the chief of naval engineering, Alban Stimmers, who also reported to Rear Admiral Joseph Smith. They decided to add a number of things. Smith had the idea of a complex tank system that could be pumped full of water to lower the ship, pumped out to raise it. This added a great deal of weight. It added a great deal of complexity. Again, without a lot of naval nautical engineering details, the Canonicus class was a hopeless failure. Erickson designed it, presented his design to Stimmers and the naval officials. When Erickson found, was told of the modifications and changes they were making, he withdrew. He just quit the project, would have nothing more to do with it. Um, and so some books will say that he designed this Casco class that was a failure. The Casco class uh, was a failure, but I think that Erickson uh, withdrew from it. Just a couple of other words about the monitor in conclusion. Some of you know that the monitor sank, of course, in, uh, uh, what was it, 18, uh, shortly after, a few months after the, uh, the battle, uh, December of 1862. Uh, but in the 1970s, it was uh, rediscovered basically and parts of it raised. And maybe some of you have been to the uh, Mariner's Museum in Newport News, but outside there, uh, there is a full-scale replica of the monitor, full, full size that you see here. Uh, and uh, the propeller has been raised. And I thought you might like to see, here is Erickson's original propeller design, his drawing. And here is the propeller of the monitor that is on display at Newport News in the uh, Maritime uh, Museum. The turret was raised uh, in, in 02. Um, and just the rediscovery, if you will, and the salvaging of parts of the monitor are incredible stories in, in themselves. Uh, and the preservation uh, of these, these artifacts, of course, now that uh, they've been uh, rescued from the deep, so to speak. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of these. Uh, Erickson, uh, all of his life, kept trying to improve his caloric engine which he finally did and by the 1870s was making quite a bit of money from this heat engine uh, to power small appliances like pumps and even fans. Uh, if you had no electricity, uh, one of these little uh, heat motors powered by a little alcohol stove could, could run a, a fan for you and things like that. He also experimented a lot with solar power and here, I would only say he was very much ahead of his time, but he realized the enormous energy from uh, sunlight and developed some solar reflectors. And the idea was that he would use the heat uh, to power one of his caloric engines. I was never able to come up with much detail on this, but uh, in the 1890s, the first of successful submarines were designed and the designer was a man named John Philip Holland that you see down here. But I found a couple references that said that uh, Erickson had done some quote, consulting work with John Philip Holland. And uh, I don't know any details. I was not able, able to find out much of that, but apparently he at least had some advisory capacity, even uh, late, very late in his life uh, on the earliest designs of submarines uh, by, by John Holland. He also designed late in his life, a torpedo boat destroyer, a small fast vessel that could fire a torpedo. Uh, a prototype was built 
And you see a couple pictures of them here. You can see all iron construction and it would fire a torpedo from under the water, from under, underneath uh, the, the, the submerged bow. Uh, the US Navy saw no reason to have it, however. Uh, and so it was just a dead end in that respect. Erickson died in 1889. The science newspaper that you see here uh, gives uh, autobiography or gives a, a obituary of him. He was certainly a very prominent man. The president ordered, here's a painting of course, but the white ship there is the cruiser, the USS Baltimore to take his remains back to Sweden, which he, where he is buried. There are other ships that have been named after him. Uh, my own area of expertise is shipping on the Great Lakes. Uh, around the year 1900, it was actually built in 1896, uh, a Great Lakes freighter that plied, well, the Great Lakes. Uh, was named the John Erickson in honor of this great engineer. It was a what in Lake Superior a shipping history we call a whaleback design. I think you can see why. Uh, the idea was that the rough waters of, of, of Lake Superior would simply uh, overflow and run off uh, this uh, deck design. It was an interesting design. Um, you don't see them anymore for the very simple reason that it was engineering wise very good. It was not an economical design. The, the holes just did not hold enough iron ore, or coal and so on to be economically viable. The US Navy in 1915 had a combat vessel, the destroyer named after Ericsson. And to this day, there is a replenish ship, the USNS, US Naval Service uh, fleet replenish ship, the John Ericsson. Uh, and down here you see it was, it's, it was called a fleet oiler. It, it supplies fuel. Uh, to, to other naval vessels and also carries dry stores and refrigerated stores. And so Erickson has not been forgotten in that sense at all. The Erickson Memorial is in Washington, DC. Here are a couple pictures of it. It was dedicated in 1926. And as my second to the last picture for you, I really love this one. This is a photograph of the dedication in 1926 of the Erickson Memorial. Former President Taft, Grace Coolidge, the Crown Prince of Sweden, and need I tell you that is President Calvin Coolidge that gave the speech. And whenever I looked at this, I think President Coolidge looks like one of those little men that stand on the top of a wedding cake along with the bride. And finally, portrait of Erickson. This portrait of him hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. It was a portrait done after his death. It is in the National Portrait Gallery of prominent Americans. And you will notice uh, in front of him on the desk uh, is the principal artifact we associate with him, the USS Monitor. With that, I thank you for your attention. And I Jerry, move. thank you. Uh, absolutely brilliant again, as usual. Uh, and to learn a whole lot more about uh, what was obviously a very fascinating individual. So um, questions or comments from, uh, from our participants? Um, I, I have a question, Jerry. I really found this fascinating. Um, and I love how you sort of talked about some of his trials and tribulations as well. Um, it sounds like Erickson was really ahead of his time, like maybe um, Nikolai Tesla was ahead of his time. In is some that, ways, yes. Is that the kind of opinion you have of him? Yeah, yeah, particularly his, uh, his lifelong work on this, solar, on, on this caloric engine. The first few were, were flops. In fact, the first one he built, uh, he lit a fire in it and melted. Um, not a good start. But he worked on it all of his life and finally perfected it and made some money on it. Uh, the solar uh, thing, too, uh, was certainly ahead of his time on that. Um, and in his day, when I mentioned the monitor, they wouldn't call it a weapon system. That's a, a much, much later phrase that's still used by the Pentagon uh, in designing expensive airplanes and so on today. But uh, 
But the monitor really was a weapon system where he took technology that was right there, tried and true, and put it together in a way that no one else had. So yeah, at least I, I agree with you. I, I think that's right, that in many ways he was. Uh, uh, he was a difficult man, probably hard to get along with, uh, hard to make friends with in some ways, but he was also a guy that was ahead of his time. Um, and uh, well, yes, I, I, I think your, your observation is a good one. And then I had one other question. I'm interested, um, it, this caloric engine, um, is, is, is there anything like that today? Or what would the, the name for that be today? Because I'd never heard that term before. The only thing that I have been able to find out was that companies market a, a little heat engine that runs a fan and you can set it on top of a wood burning stove. And it takes heat from the stove, it, it, the, the heat from the stove runs a little cylinder that's connected with, I guess, a little crankshaft that turns a fan motor. Um, I did read that as late as the 1920s, they still marketed uh, fans and, and other little pumps for household use uh, that would you, you would put like a little container, maybe a, a, a cup or two, I mean, eight or so fluid ounces of alcohol that would burn. And that would provide the heat to, to run this little engine. It, I had a course a hundred years ago on thermodynamics and I'm embarrassed to say that the only thing I remember about it is the three laws of thermodynamics. The first one says you can't win. The second one says you can't break even. And the third one says you can't even quit playing the game. So, <laughs> uh, but but, I, but I, I, the only thing, at least I was give you a serious answer. The only thing I was able to find out is apparently they do market some little fan that, that attaches to a wood stove uh, that is a heat engine. Uh, nobody uses the term caloric engine anymore. That's an archaic term, I think. But uh, but the principle uh, is there, but it, uh, uh, that's why I showed you that picture of the ship where the, you know, the heat engine worked, but not very well. Uh, so it, it was kind of a dead end when it came to uh, navigation, but for small appliance application, yeah, it was, it was a viable thing, viable uh, invention. Erickson's really interested, fascinating man I found. That is so interesting. Um, let's see, I'm, Jerry, I'm just gonna ask you if you could uh, click the thing that says stop screen share, just so that we can all see one another. There we go. And um, somebody, let me just get this, um, put into the chat. Um, are there, is there any other conflicting evidence of the date of the birth? Um, the, the Swedish stamp, I thought it was the Swedish, uses 1801. And then the second question from this person is, any other names found in research in context of his work on the torpedo ship around 1881? Uh, not really. Um, you can check a site called the US Naval History and Heritage Command. And there's another excellent source called DANFS, Dictionary of American Naval Fighting Ships. Uh, there's not too much available on Erickson's destroyer uh, because it was really a dead end as far as the Navy was concerned. Uh, he just built that one prototype and that they just weren't interested. He also designed him, Erickson himself designed that torpedo. And it turned out that there was a man named Whitehead who had designed a torpedo that was much superior. And the Whitehead torpedo is the one that really catapulted the modern submarine. So Erickson's uh, uh, design was was not the best on that, but the concept was a good one—a fast-moving ship to go in and fire torpedoes. I also think that the battleship admirals did not want to hear about that. Right. Hey, Steve, you got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Well, I had one, but I want to comment first on that caloric engine. I think what they call is it was it similar to what they call a Stirling engine. You it's very can, similar to the Stirling cycle. That's correct. Yeah, you can get them from you know little gadgets and gizmos from like American Science and Surplus. 
Yeah. Even I can't quite figure out how it works, but it's a heat exchanging, it's called a sterling. So it was along those same lines, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay, my first, my original question was, you mentioned the Princeton, Princeton debacle. I read about John Erickson when I was probably 12 years old and the book I read said that because of the Princeton and you didn't touch upon it, maybe you could expand that there was a competition, you know, for like to build an ironclad. And because of that taint, Erickson was kind of coming in third place or he was just, I mean, he was almost blackballed. Can you expand a little bit on that? Is this holdover from the Princeton debacle? Well, just off the top of my head, uh, I, I think you're certainly on the right track. The iron, the Navy had uh, three officers on an ironclad board and uh, how was it? You got me a little off track here, but when the designs were submitted, Erickson's was not one of them. And uh, it was one of his colleagues, his name escapes me right now, that went to Erickson and asked and, and, and told him what the Navy was looking for. And uh, Erickson was, you know, still pretty irked about the US Navy. He was a man that could hold a grudge. But the story is that he pulled a cardboard box out and in that box was a cardboard model of the monitor. And his friend said, you've got to show this to the, uh, the, the ironclad board because it was such a revolutionary design. Um, but there were some other ironclads. One was called the New Ironsides. And I think the other one was the Galena um, that were at first the front runners. But when they saw Erickson's design, um, they went they went with that one. I, I don't know if I've answered your question very well or not. A follow up, if you will. Well, and apparently, apparently, because his buddy prodded him. I don't know. Apparently, because his bot is Erickson was pissed off, but then because his buddy prodded him, history was changed, and he submitted his design. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, he he had your that, that's a good point. He had to be prodded really in, into doing this uh, because he still had a, a, a serious grudge against the U.S. Navy. And he never quite got over it, I don't think. And uh, when they redesigned, remember the, the shallow draft monitors, when the Navy started tampering with his work, he said to hell with you and walked off the stage, so to speak. So he, he was a cantankerous gentleman to be polite about it. <laughs> hey, Mark, you had a question. You want yeah, to I, ask your question? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, I mean, I was in the Navy and I was a gunner on a, on a Navy destroyer. And it always, I'm always interested in the, the things that happen to the, the lowly privates and sergeants. So the gun crews, anything do you ever come about uh, in your research about the gun crews on these things, about their uh, effects on their ears and their internal organs and, and that type of the brain shaking, any in the physical things you ever find out, hear anything about that when you're in your research at all? Because- uh, Well, the short answer is no, no, I really haven't. Uh, okay, yeah. Because um, there's it, extremely large uh, vibrations of your your organs and your ears and everything like that. So I just well yeah. as as an allied question or answer, uh, the crew accommodations on the monitor itself. Now mm -hmm. the officers had a rather lovely um, accommodations. They always do. <laughs> I won't argue that point in the slightest. <laughs> the crew uh, slept in hammocks, uh, sort of back by the engine room, where the ventilation was poor, the lighting was not good, uh, and some of the crew referred to uh, living on this, quote, devilish machine. Uh, so the life of the common sailor was not good in those days, not in the slightest. Uh, as far as the gunners, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I would think being that close to those huge black powder, because remember, this is still before high explosives. We're still using black powder. And boy, you know, you put 35 pounds of black powder in one of those guns and well, and that, I just can't imagine what it did to your, you physically into your hearing and so on. Right, right. Hey, Steve, they, hold on just a second. And um, Jason, you had a question. Do you want to ask your question, Jason, unmute? Well, it was just um, seeing seeing all his uh, innovations and improvements on sea vessels. Uh, is it known that um, what anything else he did, how he survived? Was he just working off the money he got 
uh, from investments? Well, he was he was paid decently. Uh, finally, of course, government contracts for the monitor and successors, the Tosaics and uh, Canonicus. Uh, but I found out that uh, the, the heat engine that I mentioned was such a failure at first, but he kept working on it with a rather dogged persistence. It was just kind of a lifelong on and off piece of research with the man. Uh, and by the time uh, I'm, I'm going to say by the 19, by the 1870s and 80s, uh, these heat engines were, were selling uh, very well. Apparently, thousands of them sold uh, for for they would drive pumps, they would drive washing machines, uh, fans, and so on uh, for small. It was a power source for what we would call small appliances before electricity was widespread. And so he apparently made quite a bit of money on, uh, uh, on, on, on um, you know, whatever, uh, franchising or not franchising, but the residuals that he got on, on these, these engines. Um, but he did not come from a wealthy family. Uh, what his estate amounted to when he died, I do not know. I don't think he died a super wealthy man, but I think his last few years money was not a problem. Um, um, okay, Steve, you want to ask your question then? Yeah, back to Mark. I remember I've been to the Mariners Museum there, in, yeah. uh, and I'd highly recommend going. And I even had the last time I was there, you know, they were soaking the turret and the two 11 inch Dahlgrens in that mm -hmm. fluid for like 15 years to leach out the salt. And the second time I was there, I just pure serendipity lucked out. They had drained the tank, they had to swap out the fluid of the turret and so you're yep. looking down and you could see it but anyway back to mark i remember reading that you know inside the the turret even though despite it had a apparently an iron grate the ventilation was terrible despite the muzzles being protruding you'd get back flashed and it was full of smoke it's just a hellish place and uh i remember there at the, again at the mariners museum he said one of the biggest problems in the design of the turret and i don't know if they ever solved it because the only way the gunners could see out was just to the side of the ports. And it was hard for them to get oriented of which way the turret was pointing. And so I think later on, they tried painting, you know, like port, starboard, whatever on the floor beneath it. So they could get at least a little bit of a frame of reference. But for the original monitor, that was a problem. And of course, I understand that the little, the gun port shields, they didn't work out. So they figured out real fast that just load slowly turn it the guy be looking as it, it was coming to bear that he'd yell fire and they'd pull the lanyard but it was apparently a real hellish place to be during battle you're absolutely right on those observations no, no question about it everything i've read just certainly would verify that um i have one other little question um i'm gathering that he uh, had patents not just in the united states but in england and perhaps other countries um I'm interested in that. Did you know maybe how many patents did he have, and did he have patents in various? Okay, countries? number one, I do not know that he had any British patents. I think Brathwaite got those. Okay. How many patents he had? I at least I, I do not know a number. But what I do know is that um, Ogden, Ogden, who was one of his supporters. If you look at the timing, I, I guess I went over that fairly fast, but uh, he, he knew Ogden as a result of the Rainhill locomotive trials, eight, uh, 1829. Erickson did not come to the United States till 1839. I neglected to mention that, but he moved to New York in 1839 with, with Stockton and Ogden and, and when he was experimenting with the, uh, the, the ship, the Stockton and then the, the, the Princeton. But there was a two or three year period in there where Ogden, Francis Ogden, was actually getting the patents for himself from Erickson's work. Now this was with Erickson's approval because Erickson wasn't a citizen. So he couldn't get an American patent in those days. He was still a Swedish citizen. So Ogden really got the patents for him. And so he realized some money from those patents and I found no comment at all that uh, there was any, you know, skullduggery that, that Ogden cheated him. You know, as I mentioned, the, the relationship between Stockton and, and Erickson uh, 
they were once friends and became very tense to say the very least and declined. But Ogden apparently was an honest and good man. So I do know that, that about the patents, uh, Delise, but beyond that, uh, I would just have to say, I, I don't know much about the actual granting of the patents. Well, I've gone a bit longer than I intended, but thank you all for your attention. I appreciate doing this. Hey, Gene, and, uh, you want to unmute, doing, Gene? I enjoyed, I enjoyed doing it. Thank you. You obviously struck a nerve. <laughs> Very well done, Jerry, and great questions, uh, participants. Yes. It, uh, it, was, it was another one of those fascinating pieces of history that doesn't get taught. And so uh, it, uh, you struck a nerve, and we appreciate that. Uh, I think with that, uh, one more thank you to Carolyn for her good work and to Elise for being the, uh, uh, the techno guru for us and, and getting the communications out. Uh, we will look forward to uh, seeing you all again in March. So meeting adjourned. Good. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Gary. Um, are we having a little board meeting right after this for those I think on the board? Carolyn had to leave for a doctor's appointment. Um, so I don't I know. know. If she, Carolyn's still there. She's still here. Yes. So we, we can have a quick meeting. So okay. if the board would hang on, we'll, we'll meet for just a few minutes before Carolyn has to depart. There we are. Okay, there we are. All right. <laughs> uh, again, Carolyn, thank you so much for your good work. Uh, on the uh, on the photos and uh, you've got the you've got the addresses for uh, mm -hmm. for our two remote speakers for this go around if you wouldn't mind uh, getting a couple of those prepared and then just whatever the cost submit it to uh, Mr. Bob for mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. reimbursement mm -hmm. and uh, let me know when they're ready and I'll I'll get a letter from from El Presidente ready to send along with. So. <laughs> Very good, yes. Uh,